All right, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> sitting here thinking about the coming of the Lord and all the stuff people are putting on YouTube about the rapture. <clears throat> uh, bunch of people, you know, saying they had a dream and a vision. And they pretty much go against God's word about uh, some of their dreams and visions, you know. And, uh, I'm just going to go right into what the Lord's given me, you know, uh, on these topics. Uh, first thing I want to go to is Matthew 24, which we have all heard that. But I'm going to give you some different perspectives to think about. And, uh, you know, Matthew 24, verse 3 Here's Jesus. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's two questions he wants to know. What's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And, you know, in verse 4, and Jesus said, Don't worry about it. You're not going to be here. He didn't say that. He said, Take heed that no man deceive you. No man deceive you. And uh, he said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you not be troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So you hear about it on the news right now, all the wars going on and all that. He's saying that's not the end yet. He said, for a nation arise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diverse places. These are just the beginning of sorrows. Um, and he said, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And I, and I believe right there, that right there is what I'm talking about. A lot of people think they're going somewhere and they're not. And they're not preparing the flock for what's coming. They're telling them they're not going to be here. They're not going to face nothing. And we know we enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. And all that live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer tribulation, persecution. Tribulation and persecution comes from man, not God. That's not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So when Jesus shows up, it's over. And I'm going to try to prove that uh, with Scripture, not with what I think or what my heart feels or whatever, but with Scripture. So he wants to know what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the world. Well, if we just jump, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but you go back and read all this yourself. But he's talking about in verse 15, when therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy, holy place, whoever readeth, let him understand. So we're going to see the Antichrist before we see Jesus. You know, um, and he says, for then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh saved but the elect's sake for those days shall be shortened it's a three and a half year period um you know he goes on to say in verse 29 here's the sign of jesus is coming in verse 29 starts the sign immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels, which are reapers, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So we're talking immediately after the tribulation, he's going to gather his elect. After the tribulation. So that means you will go through tribulation. That's why he says, um, 
If they say, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. If he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. For lightning cometh out of the east to shine to the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. So he's when Jesus is not, the Antichrist is going to show up and be Antichrist. He's probably going to look like Christ, act like Christ. He's going to deceive many people thinking he's God. And when Jesus shows up, it's like that. It's over. And, um, you know, I was sitting there thinking, I'm going to go to Matthew 13 right quick. Uh, let's read Matthew 13, verse 24. And a lot of people are going to say, you know, he's not talking to, to, uh, to Gentiles there. You know, he's I mean, he's talking to just Jews, you know. A lot of people will excuse that. Well, first of all, the Bible says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. It's one God, and that one God is in Christ. There's not three distinct people. There's one God, and that one God is in that body speaking. That's why we live by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. The flesh ain't God. God is a spirit. God needed that flesh for a sacrifice. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You've got to establish that first and you can squash these man-made doctrines by this one God teaching. Um, you know, it says uh, there is no difference in Jew, barbarian, Scythian, Gentile, Greek. You know, God's no respecter of persons. He don't care if you're a Jew or Gentile. There's one God. And we either obey that one God or we don't. But let's look right here. See, so if, there, if he was just talking to Jews and we just throw the whole Testament, the whole New Testament away, it don't apply to us, you know. That's, that's how crazy people are. They don't want to, they don't want to be a doer of the word, you know. Anything goes now. Verse 24 of Matthew 13, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a ma unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, sir, did thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? He said unto them, an enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. So there's not going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. He's not going to gather the wheat up. He'll root the tares up with them. You know, if you pull a weed up out of the ground, you'll pull some of your Bermuda grass or St. Augustine up with it if you're not careful. I will say to the reapers, wait, he said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So he's going to gather the, the tares first. <clears throat> and he goes on to explain this parable in verse 37. He said, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest, listen to this. The harvest is the end of the world. Remember them disciples want to know what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world. Well, the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. You know, I'm going to go back to Matthew 24 right there a minute. And he said, and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So he's saying the Son of Man in verse 41 shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and do iniquity. So when Christ shows up, he's coming here. We're not going there. He's bringing his saints with him and we're... He's coming here to set a thousand year reign up. He's going to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and do iniquity that still have sin in their life that are not obeying the gospel. I'm going to prove that to you. 
and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he says on over here in verse 47, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind, which when it was, drew, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but they cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, I'm going to grab this other Bible in the Amplified Version and it explains it really well what I was talking there in 17. Um, you know, he's going to sever the wicked from among the just. Well... In the Amplified and in, in Luke uh, chapter 17, it will be in verse 30, it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day. See, there's no pre, mid, or post, or pre wrath. There's just the day of the Lord. There's nowhere in your Bible those words are mentioned anywhere. So why would you want to cling to them words that don't mean nothing? There's only the day of the Lord. And the Bible says, what's the day of the Lord for you? It's a day of darkness. You know, where are we going to be found on the day of the Lord? It says, On that day, whoever's in the house talk with his belongings in his house must not come down and go inside to take them out. And likewise, whoever's in the field must not turn back. Remember what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? Whoever seeks to save his life will eventually lose it through death, and whoever loses his life in this world will keep it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. Verse 34, I tell you, on that night, when Messiah comes again, there will be two sleeping in one bed. The one, the non-believer, will be taken away in judgment. The other, the believer, will be left. There will be two women grinding at the mill together. The one, the non-believer, will be taken away in judgment. The other, the believer, will be left. And that's in Luke 17, verse 30 through 35, an amplified version. And the one leaving... The one leaving is the sinner. Let me prove it to you. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2. Uh, you know, I studied this. You know, I used to think I was going to be one leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm staying. God ain't building a kingdom. God ain't building an army just to take us up out of here. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it. You know, he's going to bind the tares first in the bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat in them a barn. So let's look at um, 2 Thessalonians now. You know, um, well, let me go to first to Second Peter first and cover something. Let's go to Second Peter and and have your Bible and check me because I don't want to tell you something that's not in Scripture. I'm not going to subscribe to words that's not in the Scripture. He says uh, in verse seven of Second Peter chapter three, verse seven, starting there. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The day of the Lord starts the thousand year reign. <laughs> the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord, has, and a lot of people are going to tell you it's already come. And in Timothy, he says some of them have already said the resurrection has already passed, overthrowing the faith of some. A lot of people are going to tell you this has already happened. But these epistles write about the day of the Lord, so it hasn't happened. In verse 10, it says, this is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved of what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Looking for a hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And this is the part, you know, the Lord's coming here. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at this. Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for new heavens. We, as Christians, we look for new heavens and a new earth where dwell righteousness. Because when the Lord Jesus shows up, the Bible says either we're like him or we're not. And if we're not like him, we're going to be spit out in the outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth. And he says in verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things. So, so as Christians, if I'm reading this with common sense, I should be looking for these things. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now, what I was quoting there, um, it says, in First uh, John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have conf confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Because when the Lord comes to earth, there's not going to be no sin. Where the Lord is, there's no sin. And people ain't preaching this in the churches today. They're saying you can have your sin and God too. And you can't. When the Lord shows up, <laughs> it's going to be a day of darkness. <laughs> It says, we should not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteous is born of him. In chapter 1 John, um, chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that has his hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. Because we're just supposed to be sober, be of the day of the Lord. <clears throat> now I'm going to jump over here to 2 Thessalonians. And um, i tell you what, before I go to 2 Thessalonians, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because a lot of people are going to use this as pre-tribulation rapture verses. Let's just read it as it's written and believe it with our heart. You know, I want to prepare people for what's coming. Verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You know, when they stoned Stephen, he fell asleep. He's asleep in Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. So there's going to be people that are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Shall not prevent them which are asleep, because they're already with the Lord. They're already there. And when the Lord comes here, he's bringing them with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That don't sound like a secret to me. He's going to come with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds, which are people, to meet the Lord in the air that's in the breath. And so shall we be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, see, it's a day of the Lord, cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as traveling upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness that that day. See, there's no pre, mid, post, None of that in your Bible. There's only the day of the Lord. That's all you can find in your scripture. That's like there's no God the Father, God the Son. God the Son ain't in your Bible. There's only the Son of God. And we want to believe all these things that man, religion is man-made. 
And Paul said, if I would obey man, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. God himself came in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. These things are important. God didn't become flesh. God is a spirit. You didn't become the shirt. You're manifested in the shirt. He said, but brethren, you are not in the darkness, verse 4, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as, uh, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting at verse 4. And Paul gives a, a second letter to the Thessalonians. Listen to how this goes now. Chapter, chapter 1, verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and your faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So he's writing this to the church, not to the lost. These epistles are addressed to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. See, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Verse 7, here it is. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So here's what squashes a pre-tribulation doctrine. The wrath of God is not tribulation. That's from man. When the devil's cutting people's heads off, that's not revealed from heaven. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. I hope that makes sense. Verse 7, And you are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Remember, he's going to give a shout. He's going to send his angels forth to gather his elect from the earth. What you're going through tribulation. Unless those days were shortened, there would be no flesh saved. What's he going to be doing in verse 8? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And I just read you when he appears, either we're like him or we're not. Now, how many people say they love Jesus but don't obey the gospel today? They still smoke, they drink, they cuss. My Bible says those that cuss and talk foolish are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's now and then. <laughs> They're not cussing in heaven. The Bible says you are the temple of God. You are God's building. How many people are still doing the things of the world and they say they're going to heaven? My Bible says in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So that means saints are going to be here on the earth when he comes back during tribulation and to be admired and all them believe because our testimony among you is believed in that day. See, it's just the day of the Lord. You know, that's hard to understand when you're drunk with the wine of the fornication of the beast system. You know, <clears throat> Jesus said, beware of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Pharisees and scribes. He said, beware of the false doctrine of them. You know, if you go up to a church and they're preaching a little bit of false doctrine, you'll go in your heart, all oh, these people love Jesus. I, you know, I'm just going to be, I'm going to fellowship with them. That's, hey, I'm going to tell you something. You better run from that teaching. If it's false, get away from it. Because you'll accept it in your heart. I remember I sat in a little Baptist church. The Lord didn't say be Baptist. John the Baptist came to bear witness of the light. He was not the light, the Bible says in John 1. So why would I want to call myself something that ain't the light? I'd want to call myself by the name of Jesus Christ. You're not, you're not called by Jesus Christ till you're baptized into Jesus Christ. 
But I would sit there and listen to these false doctrines and tell, hey, how we're not going to go through this. We're not going to. That was not preparing me for what's coming. So let's read chapter 2 here, Second Thessalonians. Now we beseech you, brethren. So this is written to the brethren by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by gathering together to meet him. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. See, it's the day of the Lord. And, and we read in the epistles in 1 John, he's writing that to Christians that when the Lord comes back, we're either like him or we're not. Because where he comes and puts his foot down, he's coming with his saints. I'm going to stop right there and read you something in Zechariah about the coming of the Lord. You know what I'm talking about there. When the Lord puts his foot down, what's that look like? Here's what it looks like. <clears throat> Chapter 14, verse 1 of Zechariah. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to the battle, and the city shall be taken. And the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and the and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be not shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Listen to this, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So he's going to put his foot down when he comes back on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east of the Mount of Olives. That's why everybody's buried facing the east. <laughs> shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Ye shall, ye shall flee like as fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzzah the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all his, the saints with him. In the day of the Lord's when the saints are coming back with him. You know, we go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When he shall come, in verse 10, to be glorified in his saints. And we can't prevent them that are asleep because he's bringing them with him. Jude says he comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon the face of the earth. You know? That's quoted out of Enoch chapter 1 verse 9. That was prophesied by Enoch in Enoch chapter 1 verse 9. You can find out what he's quoting there in Jude. But you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, verse 1, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together to meet him. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Chapter 3. Let no man deceive you. Remember Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you. By any means, for that day, not the pre-tribulation rapture, not the mid-tribulation rapture, not the post -tribulation, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So he's coming first. The Antichrist is the one coming first. He's going to think, he, and a lot of people, you know, his job is to capture the church. And he's done done it. He's done captured the church. They're ready to follow anything. They're following man and these false prophets telling them there's not going to be, hey, they're not going to have to go through nothing. They're going to escape all this stuff. Well, they're not obeying the gospel anyway, and the false prophets ain't obeying the gospel. Verse 4, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he is God, set it in the temple of God, showing at himself that he is God. He said, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. He's warning us. And he says in verse 8, I'm going to skip to verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see what I'm saying? The Lord's going to destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. So who's coming first? The Antichrist. <clears throat> Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, 
and with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should not should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, and a lot of these people, they put their sins on Facebook. They'll be raising their hands, shouting, Glory, Jesus, one day. And the next day, they'll be on Facebook with a beer or Coors Light in their hand, preaching, the, you know, telling you that they love the Lord. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm warning you. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You know, I... Uh, a lot of people ain't preaching on this. Let me tell you what Jeremiah chapter 23 says. Well, I'm going to start in Jeremiah 22. No, Jeremiah 23. I'm bad. My bad. Let me just read it to you. Verse 1. Woe be unto the pastures that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastures that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. He goes on to say in verse 9, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man. I like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. Verse 13. No, verse 10. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil. Their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house I have found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them. Even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. Verse 13. I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesy in Baal and cause my people Israel to err. You think about the once saved, always saved doctrine. You're not saved till you're there. Paul said, I finished the course. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. Now there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. And not for me only, but all them. You see what I'm saying? Jesus is our salvation. He provides salvation. It stands. Either we walk to it or we walk away from it. He said, I've seen folly in the prophets. They cause my people to err. You know, when you preach these lies to people, hey, you're saved. You can do whatever you want. You're causing people to err. That's nowhere in scripture. It says it'd been better for you have not to known the way of the truth than to turn from the holy commandment. It's like a dog going back to the vomit. It says, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remain no more sacrifice for sins, but a fireful indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Verse 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. Man, I've seen this. I've seen people up behind the pulpit doing crazy things. They got sin in their own life. They're not free themselves. A lot of people just want to be seen and heard. They ain't going to preach nothing to you. If you're preaching the truth, you're not going to be popular. You're not going to be popular. If you got a big old falling, chances are you're not preaching the truth. <laughs> you're tickling people's ears. Let me read you something on that right there right quick. About tickling people's ears. It's coming to me in 1 Timothy uh, or 2 Timothy. Um, um, chapter 2, or chapter uh, 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. <laughs> Not before that. 
He's going to judge us right there at his appearing and his kingdom. He's bringing his kingdom here. Preach the word. How many people are preaching the word of God? People running to and fro. There's a famine in the land right now for hearing the words of God. And there's people doing deliverance services and all that that still ain't obeying the gospel. And Jesus said, in that day, in that day, many are going to say to me, have we not done all these things in your name? Cast out devils and all that? That's a big old thing going on right now. People casting out devils, but they're not obeying the gospel. That don't save you. It says in Matthew eleven twenty. 20, then he began to denounce most of the people in the cities where most of his miracles were done because they didn't repent and change their hearts and their lives. Deliverance don't save you because it says once a house is swept clean, he goes and gets some more of his buddies and comes back and he enters that house and the man's estate is worse than when he began. The only way you're cleaned up is preaching the word of God. I don't care if God does any more miracles for me. I believe in signs, miracles, and wonders, but I know they don't save me. Obeying the gospel does. Remember, it takes vengeance on them that obey not the gospel. He said, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. He said, for now I'm ready to be offered at the time of my departures at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. See, it's a whole different gospel. But you know, right here he's talking about these false prophets in Jeremiah 23, in verse 15. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will fill them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall, for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profane gone forth into the land, all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. See, we're supposed to cause his people to hear his words, not our heart. Our heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it, saith the Lord? He trieth the reins of the heart. Verse 17, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, Ye shall have peace. And they say to everyone that walketh after their imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood, listen to this. But if they have stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil way and from their evil doings. How many people are causing you to hear God's word and is causing you to turn from your evil way? If you still have strongholds, addictions, you have company in your life. Verse 23, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and the earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. You know, let me go back right there to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together to meet him, that you be seen not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by a spirit, nor by a word, nor by a letter from us, at the day of Christ is at hand. Hey, I'm not worried about Jesus showing up yet um, concerning these prophets. He's not coming till we see the Antichrist first, and the church is ready to worship the Antichrist. I'm telling you, he's done captured the church. That's why the Lord said, come out from among her and be not drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
These people saying, I've seen the rapture. They ain't seen nothing because that's not in the scripture. They're not telling you what the word of God is. I'm showing you scripture by scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. I'm making it harmonize with the Old Testament, with the New Testament. He said in verse 26, How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that has dream, that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues, and he and saith, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord. You know how everybody's running, the Lord told me this. The Lord told me that, did he? I used to be caught up in that. Boy, the Lord showed me this. The Lord, the Lord didn't show me nothing. It's finished in his word. That's what he showed me. This is what's coming. Verse 32, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit these people at all, saith the Lord. And when these people or the prophet or priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man in his house. Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For you have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus shall thou say to the prophet, What has the Lord answered thee, and what has the Lord spoken? But since you say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because you say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, Ye shall not say the burden of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and will forsake you. And the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and the perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. You know, if you go to Revelation chapter 6, it gives you a complete outline of what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. Then after that, it gives you a breakdown of how it's going to happen. But in verse 6, or chapter 6 of Revelation, starting at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. So there's people being killed for the word of God in the great tribulation and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not avenge, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, quake. and the sun became black sat cloth, as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs, and when she is shaken of a mighty wind. I'm going to stop right there and go back to Matthew 24 when we started. This is during great tribulation. What will be the sign of your coming? In the end of the world. Immediately after the tribulation, verse 29 of those days, shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, 
And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I'm going to read it again, verse 12. And behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is going right along with what Jesus said. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man hid him, themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains of the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him, not them, that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be of a stand? So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So we know that the great day of the Lord, there's two things happening, separating the sheep from the goats. And this is wrath. And wrath over here where he's cutting people's heads off and being slain for the word of God is not wrath. If you go over here to Revelation chapter um, 12, 12, 12, Therefore rejoice, rejoice you heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that is has but a short time. So, wrath, the devil's got his wrath, and God's got his wrath. The devil's wrath is not the wrath of God, because when God comes back, he destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. So he hasn't came yet. If you say he's came before that, there would be... Two more comings of the Lord. There's only one more coming of the Lord. The day of the Lord. You know, um, and I've quoted this several times during this study. Um, let's see here. The book of Amos. Chapter 5, verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. So he takes vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. So what's the day of the Lord for you? Where do you stand? Are you obeying the gospel? Are you going to be like Christ when he shows up? And I've failed a lot of times myself. I have a burning desire in my heart to tell people this. It's like the more you try to tell people the truth, the more they kick against the pricks. They'd rather believe man than God, what man's got to say about all this and not God. Um, you know, I want to go to Luke. Um, I believe it's chapter 17. Listen to this. <clears throat> um, verse 24. Verse 22, Luke 17, 22, starting there. And he said unto his disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. We're not there yet. We're not. We're not crying, come quickly, Lord. We're not there yet. They shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them nor follow them. For as lightning that lighteneth out of one part of heaven shineth unto the other part of heaven so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. It's just the day of the Lord. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected this generation. Listen to this, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the floods came and destroyed them all. Well, who did the floods destroy? It didn't destroy the righteousness. Remember, the sinner's going to be rooted out of the earth, the transgressors. 
Who did it root out of the earth? Verse 28. Likewise, also it, it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day, the same day, remember he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You remember who, who came and got Lot and his daughters and wife out of Sodom? It was the angels, the reapers. He said, and remember we read in Matthew 13, he said, I will say to the reapers, which are the angels, first gathered to tares and bundles and burn them. Verse, uh, yeah. So it's just the day of the Lord. Um, let's see here. There's so much to study and talk about. You're just going to have to get in there for yourself and read it. Um, you know, I think it's in Timothy. I think it's in... Uh, or maybe it's in... Let me see here. There is so much to study. Um, he says uh, in Philippians verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's a good um, scripture there. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. He says uh, in Second Timothy... He says, um, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us a call and called us with a holy calling. That's pretty powerful. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereon I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwell in us. Then he says, the Lord, in verse 18, grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. See, that's what I'm here to preach to you. The day of the Lord. There's only the day of the Lord. There's nothing else. Anybody that tells you is a liar, you know? Uh, there's, no, there's nowhere in here that I can find where you're leaving before that day, period. 
You can, you can, theology is witchcraft. That's, that's uh, man trying to explain God's word that it really don't mean what he's saying. You know, a lot of people are using witchcraft on people instead of just reading it as it's written. Jesus said, it is written. It is written. It is written. That's why we need to be reading the word of God. That's the only thing going to save us. It's the only thing going to keep us from falling. There's another scripture coming to me. Uh, you know, in Revelation chapter 3, a lot of people love to use this verse right here for a pre-tribulation rapture. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. See, they're saying right there, see, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go through nothing. But the word keep don't mean remove. So if you go to John 17 and back that up with what Jesus said, <clears throat> He says, um, in verse 15 of John 17, I pray thou that thou should not take them out of the world, but thou shall keep them from evil. Keep means to hold fast, to keep, not remove. So if you want to be able to go through tribulation and endure, which some of us will, some of us will die before it comes. But if we're going to be able to go through it, we've got to be full of the word and full of the Holy Ghost. You know, they stoned Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost. He, he couldn't lay his life down unless he was full of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, right now, a lot of people are beginning to lose their love for each other because of the gospel. And there's a separation coming. There's even a separation coming with parents from their kids and kids from their parents because of the way they live and their lifestyles. You know, you can't be drinking from both cups and eating from both tables. Either you're in or you're out. You can't <clears throat> still be doing things of the world. The old man's supposed to be dead and the new man's supposed to be alive. A lot of people still want to put the grave clothes back on after they've come out of them. So anyway, I hope that this has helped somebody. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that this word go out and manifest in Jesus' name. Amen.